today. I'm going to put up the um, agenda again, then I will put up uh, the ground rules for today to make sure that everybody um, understands what we're doing today. So I'll, I'll put up the ground rules just briefly. Whoop, there's the agenda for today. So we have a very packed agenda. So I wanna make sure people are respectful of time so that we can get everybody in. So um, here's our agenda for today. Um, and I'm gonna come back and I will show you our ground rules for our meeting. Um, it doesn't come up as ground rules, there we go. Um, ground rules for our meeting. Um, so just so everyone knows, um, being online is a little different than being in person. So I just want to make sure that everybody uh, recognize that INC, we are here to um, make sure that everybody has an opportunity to hear issues that are coming before the city. Um, we have our non-discrimination policy, but also just to make sure that we are respectful of other folks and their time and their um, participation here today. We just wanna make sure that people respect everyone else. Everyone has the opportunity to be heard um, and we will hopefully have an opportunity to have discussion and discourse. Um, but if things get um, a little too heated, we shut that off. So um, the chat could be um, sent to only me and I could take notes and I will respond and call on participates if necessary. All right, so I'm going to go back and stop sharing my screen. So I want to go ahead and start just by welcoming everybody today and also by saying that um, um, that um, we have, again, a packed agenda for today. And you saw the agenda. Uh, I'll bring it back up if I can. Here we go. Um, sorry. Yep, that's not it. <laughs> All righty, so I will bring that up in a second. Um, what we have today and what I'd like to do is um, I'd like a motion from the floor to approve uh, the May's minutes. Do I have a motion? I'll make the motion. Okay. Uh, Emmett made the motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it. And who is that who seconded it? Pete? Yeah, Pete from uh, Highlands, or uh, Honey, excuse me. Honey, thank you. All right, we have, uh, what I'm going to do is have all of you just go ahead and in um, the reactions below, if you can either raise your hand and if you approve, um, go ahead and raise your hand, okay? Or put a thumbs up, that's great. And keep your hands up if you can. I know a couple have gone down. Um, all right, you can go ahead and lower your hands. And any opposed? Oops, my hand is supposed to be lowered, but it's not lowering. Uh, one opposed? Or was that not meant to be an opposed, Thomas? I can't get it. The flag. Okay, <laughs> you got it down now. So, okay. So no, no opposed, any abstentions? All right, the motion carries. Um, we're gonna go ahead and go into um, our committee reports. Why don't we go ahead and start? Uh, let's start with, I mean, who wants to start today? Um, could we go ahead? Uh, I think Chris, go ahead, Greg, you can do the. Yeah, the treasurer's report is really very fast. There was, um, the only expense we had last night, last month was $149.90 for our Zoom license. Um, 
we had two memberships of $80, and that was the extent of the activity in our financial accounts. Um, checking was $992, savings $13,968, and the INC Community Fund is $26,014. So our total assets are $41,019. And there was no activity in the community fund uh, last month. That's it. Thanks, Greg. Um, Christine, did you want to go next? Yeah, we don't have a, a firm agenda for June. Ian ha is away. He has some feelers out to get some reports from state level um, people on what's going on in affordable housing. And we've asked the city, and we're a little disappointed, but we've asked CPD to come last month and give a report on how, what policies, land use policies, development policies, neighborhood planning changes are being made in CPD that align with CASER and the climate and sustainability goals of the city. And we're waiting to see if they'll come in June. That's all I have. Okay, great. Um, did we have, speaking of climate and sustainability, do we have anybody, do we have from the committee? And I don't, let me look through. Oh yeah, I can talk about that too. Okay. I don't, I don't see um, Keith or Jane Potts. I don't see either one of them. Um, so, um, I'll brief, are you referring to the report for their last meeting or the report on July 9th, the delegate meeting? Either one. Okay. Well, their July 9th meeting, a lot of us here probably were in attendance, was on trees and it was very good. It had a CSU speaker who was really great and answered a lot of questions and had Lindsay from the park people talking about um, tree planting throughout the city, this Westwood effort that's gone on for years and how that, where that is, and then Iverson GES. So it was excellent. And then out of that, um, we're leading up to the July 9th delegate meeting that's next month, will be on heat islands in general with the Trust for Public Land speaking and then she'll bring it down to maps of Denver. And then we're going, we're lining up some people from a couple of neighborhoods who've actually worked on some tree planting steps. So it'll be a good meeting. All right, great, thank you. Um, so you heard what next month is. Thomas, did you have a question? Um, I just wanted to comment that on Earth Day, I was among the people, 150 people at Sloan's Lake Park when we planted 150 trees in the park. Well, that's awesome. I hope they get water <laughs> with how dry it is. <laughs> I do too. Yeah, that's the tough thing. It's, it's, a, it's a tough year. So, well, thank you. We appreciate that. All right. Um, do we have, I don't know if there's an update. I think that helps. I don't know, Maggie, if you wanted to add anything about the heat islands or if if that was you know sufficient because I think that's a lot of planning going into next month's meeting. No, I don't have anything to add. Okay, all righty. Um, I think we'll go to transportation. Um, why don't we go ahead, Joel, and then you can segue into the the next issue too. Thanks very much. <clears throat> and uh, is it, uh, am I set up to share my screen as well, Maggie? No, I can do that for you. Okay, thanks. Hi, I'm Joel Noble. I chair the Transportation Committee for INC. And um, we meet every other month. So we met last uh, last month, and I gave a readout on that last time we met. Our next meeting will be in July, and we have a number of uh, items coming into focus for that. We typically get, you know, really high attendance uh, for for INC committees, and and we're really proud of the fact that we get uh, a diverse set of folks of, of ages and locations throughout the city, uh, because INC transportation is known as a place you can go to to plug into uh, what's happening on transportation, and uh, we've been doing that successfully for for many years. Our meetings tend to be uh, pretty pretty packed um, with. Uh, 
up to four topics uh, per meeting. And so if you want to come, we'll be meeting next on the second Thursday of July and um, watch uh, email for announcements of the of the topics. Uh, as announced last month, we have a motion that was uh, sent out to the delegates. So I'll bring this up. And please let me know if you can see my screen correctly. Loretta? We can Hello? see it. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, just a bit of context. Um, 16 years ago, INC Zoning and Planning Committee, before we had a uh, transportation committee, passed a, a sidewalk position statement. And this was in response to the fact that uh, right now, unlike the rest of our public infrastructure in Denver, we uh, make the proper, each property owner responsible for paying for sidewalk installation and repair. And that can be a huge bill. And because we do it this way, we end up with a patchwork quilt that we have of sidewalk. You know, one piece of sidewalk will be in good repair. Another piece will be in bad repair. There might be missing segments. And when people are cited by the city to say, you need to fix your sidewalks, because of course we know that you know, sidewalks are fundamental to people getting around, whether they're young or old, if they have mobility issues, if they're walking or jogging, um, not being in the street, good sidewalks are important. Um, and of course, we're trying to focus on public transportation and sidewalks are fundamental to making public transportation work. Um, INC passed a position that said, we need to change the way that we pay for this infrastructure. Uh, if we each had to individually pay for the street outside of our house and make our own arrangements with contractors when there's a pothole in the street outside of our house, that would be very hard for people to come up with that money in a timely way and it would be completely inefficient. But that's exactly uh, what we do with sidewalks. So for 16 years, INC has had this position that was then rolled into our INC transportation platform our platforms being uh, collections of positions on topics. We have a, a zoning and planning platform and a transportation platform and a parks platform. And I've excerpted here um, the first three parts of our walkability section of the INC transportation platform that recognizes that sidewalks are fundamental, uh, that Denver should, should adopt measures to complete and preserve sidewalks, which we don't have right now. and, and honoring flagstone sidewalks where that's important to the character. But then here's the important part. Denver should replace the current city policy that makes individual homeowners responsible for the cost of installing or repairing sidewalks with alternative sources of funding that leverage the city's negotiating power to get the best value. Again, when we each have to uh, go out and negotiate ourselves uh, because we've been cited, it can be thousands or tens of thousands of dollars that people just can't come up with. Um, so uh, we've been pushing on this for many years as INC. Uh, it's part of our transportation platform. It's part of our ZAP platform. And when I meet with council members um, wearing my INC hat, I'm always saying, where are we on this? Can we move forward? INC met with the mayor's office in 2019, and each of the committee chairs was asked to bring one key topic that we're going to ask the mayor, can you make progress on this? And this was the key topic. Can we can we you know, grow up and treat sidewalks like the infrastructure uh, that they are? Um, and, and there's been no motion. Now, what's happened uh, from the city's perspective, what's happened recently in the past year is a lot of regular attendees of the INC Transportation Committee uh, working together and working through other nonprofits and advocacy groups have come together under the Denver Streets Partnership umbrella with the leadership of Jill Locantori and said, look, uh, like a, a lot of other uh, ballot initiatives that have come forward from residents, when things aren't getting done, um, it, it's probably time that we come forward with something saying we need to transfer responsibility from, uh, for sidewalks from the individual property owners to the city and ask the voters if that's what they want to do, because it's clear that uh, council and the mayor aren't getting around to it. I've participated in that, and I've been happy to be uh, to have helped shape that so that it aligns point for point with what we've been asking for at INC. We have um, Jill Locantori on the call. She's um, the executive director of the Denver Streets Partnership. 
And as you all saw in the meeting announcement, has given two presentations, one to the Transportation Committee, one to the Zoning and Planning Committee on this ballot initiative that's been officially filed and is in the process of gathering signatures. Our hope and the Transportation Committee um, in, in asking the delegates to affirm this position, which uh, as you saw in the notes, the Transportation Committee did unanimously, is we're hoping that INC will officially support the Denver Deserves Sidewalk Ballot Initiative, and the motion is here on the screen, to refer to the voters the question of removing responsibility for repairs from adjacent property owners and placing the responsibility on the city, establishing a dedicated fee to fund this work, and that INC urges all member RNOs to support this important issue. So that's the motion uh, here in front of us. This was announced a month ago, and uh, it's been fully discussed at committees. So I think it, it uh, checks all the boxes for our approach to this. And now we'll have some discussion and see, see if we're ready to uh, take a position. And I'll take this off the screen, but I can always put it back. Uh, you can keep it on the screen for the moment. Uh, Joel, okay. there's one question in the chat from Christine. It says, is this the first time INC has proposed creating a new enterprise fund? to collect fees from residents based on frontage to support sidewalks? I don't think there's ever been a, a sidewalk proposal before because the city has never brought one forward. It's it's up to the up to the residents, it seems, because they're not they're not playing their part in, in our elected officials. So uh, this is the first time we have uh, we collectively, the residents have brought this forward uh, to do the thing that INC has been calling for all these years. Um, okay. I would point out the fact that uh, Christina is absolutely right. There's an enterprise fund. And what, what that means is one of the criticisms um, that people can have with the government is you raise money for one thing, but they use it for something else. And um, uh, that can't happen in this case. It's a dedicated fee, can only be used for sidewalks, for the administration of the program, and for you know ancillary changes and repairs necessary to put the sidewalk in. By being an enterprise fee, uh, that lets them bond against it to accelerate, uh, accelerate fixing the sidewalks because we've got a lot of deferred maintenance. And I do wanna invite uh, Jill Locantori at any point to uh, unmute because she has a great way of talking about why this is so, um, uh, so valuable. But uh, Loretta, your meeting, I'll, I'll let you call on people. Um, why don't we go ahead? I think Maggie and then we'll go to Jill. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, yes, I do have a comment. Um, I, I went back into our old newsletters to 2006, I believe, when we, uh, when there was something done about this particular thing. Uh, and so my comment is, um, well, let me, let me, get through this. Uh, Mary Myers brought this to, I believe, the zoning committee at one point and asked that uh, they um, approve the position that University Park had done regarding their sidewalks, which this was based on. Uh, and as a, as a comment on that, uh, when it did go to the delegation to pass, the sidewalk construction or the approval that sidewalk construction be funded by means other than billing homeowners. So I don't see the difference personally. And I think that what we approved previously based on University Park had to do with, yeah, we, we want to have uh, good sidewalks, but uh, we don't wanna build the homeowners. How is this different? Oh, thank you. Uh, th this is worlds different. Um, right now, what happens is a sidewalk will, you know, be in rough repair, and um, a homeowner will get billed, will not get billed, they'll get cited, and they'll have to go find somebody to repair that sidewalk, which can, which can be thousands or or tens of thousands of dollars. There may be some people on the call. I know there are some people on the call who've who've priced out bringing their sidewalks up to repair. If instead we all collectively are paying into a fund, a fund, it's similar to road repair. I don't think you would say that we all individually pay for road repair in the same way that right now we could get socked with a huge bill for sidewalks. We don't get socked with a huge bill for road repair. 
Why is that? That's because we're all continuously paying in uh, taxes that themselves are used for road repair. Uh, all money that the government uses uh, comes from us uh, eventually. There's, there's, no, uh, th there's no magic source of money. It's all taxes or fees at one point or another, but it, this really does what the initial position statement well, was getting at, which was individual owners having to episodically come up with a huge amount of money. Instead, a modest fee uh, just allows the city to take responsibility for sidewalks. Um, let me let me go if we can get Jill because I think there is a, a good question from Drew in the chat that says, "How does this initiative address the fees in low-income neighborhoods, i.e., um, Globeville, Elyria, Swansea, Cole, Sunnyside, etc.?" And because and then the other is the other question is regarding you know neighborhoods and properties that have no sidewalks. So maybe we can have. Jill, and then we'll go to some other questions, okay? Great, and, and maybe Jill, you want to address Drew, Drew's question, um, and this will get you uh, talking and, and the, in the spotlight because uh, you've been such a leader on this. Sure, good morning, everybody. I'm Jill Locantori. I'm the Executive Director of the Denver Streets Partnership. Um, as Joel said, INC has been advocating for sidewalks for 16 years. I've been advocating for sidewalks for seven years, first with Walk Denver and now with Denver Streets Partnership. And it is often the number one issue that I hear from when I meet with community members throughout the entire city. And I hear from people, they believe it should be publicly funded like other basic infrastructure. And so that is really the foundation of our campaign. To specifically answer Drew's questions, it was very important to us to make sure that we were addressing equity in how we were structuring both the costs of the program and the distribution of the benefits of the program. And we had input from neighborhoods across the city, including neighborhoods like Montbello and Westwood in shaping the design of the program. We consulted with the Denver Office of Economic Development and Opportunity um, and where we landed on was a 20% discount on the fee for every property in neighborhoods that have been designated uh, through the NEST program in Denver, the Neighborhood Equity and Stabilization Program. These are neighborhoods that are lower income. They have traditionally received less investment in infrastructure of all kinds, um, including sidewalks. They tend to have the worst sidewalk networks and they're at risk of gentrification and displacement. And so every neighborhood that is designated a nest uh, neighborhood, those properties automatically receive a 20% discount. There's no action required on the part of the individual homeowner. There is no income qualification or other administrative burden required to implement that. Uh, we realize there are low income residents in other parts of the city. And so there is also the option in the, the ordinance for residents to defer the payment of the fee until the point of sale of their home. Uh, that may be a particularly attractive option for older adults who may have a fixed income and their house is their primary asset. And then the second question was about there are many streets in GES that do not even have sidewalks. This program is intended to build out and maintain a comprehensive network citywide. So the funds would be used to build sidewalks where they're currently missing. They would be used to widen sidewalks that are currently not compliant with ADA standards. So they're not wide enough for a wheelchair. And it would provide funding in perpetuity to repair sidewalks, knowing that even though sidewalks are, are pretty sturdy infrastructure, they do start to crumble and every sidewalk in Denver will need to be repaired at some point. And this uh, program would provide funding for that. All right, uh, Joel, if you can stop sharing your screen, I can't tell you know, whose hands are up. Sure. Uh, Rosemary, yeah. I think you're next. Um, yes, I live in University Park, and I just want to explain a little bit more University Park's position over the years regarding um, sidewalks. So it was actually 18 years ago that Mary Myers put together the sidewalk position statement that was adopted by our RNO, and then she brought it to INC. And the specific wording in that was... Um, advocating for alternative sources of funding, such as a sidewalk initiative, a cost sharing arrangement, or a combination. 
We adopted that in 2018. Then again, and Jill could tell me the exact year, we also voted to support Walk Denver's sidewalk position that is very similar to what um, is put, what is being put forward now. When Jill was the director of Walk Denver, we also supported that initiative. So through the years, we have continually supported alternative sources for funding. We haven't had time to, to actually take an actual vote this time around, but I just wanted to fill everybody in on how our neighborhood has taken a position on this over the years. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to recognize that Michael Henry is here with us. Um, of course, one of the co-founders of INC and longtime uh, ZAP chair. Um, th thanks for being here, Michael. And if you um, if you have comments, I know you've had a hard time doing the raise hand feature, just give us a wave. There's a couple questions in the chat, if it's okay, Loretta. Bruce, um, uh, Bruce was asking, uh, council people have brought up uh, blaming uh, city attorneys for saying we can't take on the liability. Um, we know that's that's always been an excuse, um, but that excuse no longer holds. Not only have other cities in, in the metro area taken responsibility for sidewalks like Inglewood uh, with no problem, there actually was a court case uh, that went all the way to the Colorado Supreme Court, um, I think last year, uh, in Boulder, four sidewalks that were in bad repair that Boulder was responsible for repairing. And they were able to show that they had a funded good program for repairing sidewalks that they just hadn't gotten to that one yet. Um, and the courts, all the courts were convinced that uh, Boulder was doing a diligent job um, and uh, they didn't have any undue liability. So uh, that, uh, that objection or that uh, I would say excuse has kind of um, melted away. And then uh, secondly, Bruce has brought up um, uh, very few of property owners he's aware of near him have been cited. That's kind of the way it is when you look around Denver. We, we know we've got crummy sidewalks everywhere, but the city is reluctant to cite people, even though that's the way we have in our process to get them fixed, because they know people can't come up with thousands or tens of thousands of dollars uh, suddenly. So the city pretends that uh, property owners will take care of sidewalks and the property owners pretend to take care of sidewalks and we have uh, we have the unequitable uh, mess that we have now. The people with mobility issues, older adults, people with any disability have a very hard time navigating. Brad, uh, uh, go ahead. Okay, um, yeah, um, Brad Cameron with Neighbors for Greater Capitol Hill. Uh, first of all, I really do want to thank uh, Jill and Denver Street Partnerships for their continuing effort on raising awareness on our sidewalk problem. The, the city and county of Denver has just really fallen down on this, and uh, it's, it's clearly time for citizens to take action. However, I do feel that there is a serious flaw in the proposal that's being put forward. And let me explain a little bit. Uh, and the discussion here hasn't really touched on it. I did listen to the INC uh, presentation and uh, the funding mechanism uh, is based upon uh, the adjacent property owners uh, amount of linear, uh, linear foot um, frontage on a street. And so we still have a situation where in essence, the adjacent property owners are being asked to, to pay for this. And it does have a real inequitable uh, impact. My next door neighbor lives on a corner and I went over and measured her street frontage and using the, the linear foot of $2.15 uh, for an annual fee, my neighbor would have a fee of $460 every year. And what has been talked about in this proposal is how, well, the average property owner would only be about $100. But there are certainly some, uh, some many situations of corner lots, other properties where the fee can be much, much larger. And I think this is a really uh, an inequitable situation to, to sort of place. It, it really is back to putting the burden on the backs of the adjacent property owners to pay for their sidewalks, when in reality, we should focus putting this on the city. And I think the flaw, the problem should be that we should be looking at 
a dedicated property tax. Uh, again, there are equitable issues with any sort of tax, but that would much more broadly spread the burden of pain for our sidewalks and not put the burden on, on, on property owners and unduly on those who have a lot of street frontage. So I have serious concerns with that. And based upon that, I really do feel that this uh, needs to be rethought and uh, um, redone. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, um, I'll, I'll just comment that um, uh, a lot of discussion was had about uh, this with the, with the group, including INC Transportation Committee members and, and other advocates that put it together um, and, and modeling it off of, uh, you know, what is, what is the responsibility now? Um, if the more sidewalk you have, if you're on a corner, the more liability you have to repair that. Um, and so the cost to repair with that uh, a corner lot, I'm on a corner lot, um, is far larger than somebody who's on a small lot with just a little bit of frontage. Um, and so having it be commensurate with that uh, made sense. If you think about the stormwater fee, uh, the stormwater fee is something we all pay into uh, and it scales based on how much impervious land we have. Um, so we're, we're used to paying in based on the amount of impact that we have on something. That said, I do want to point out something because, uh, as Bruce has pointed out in the chat, um, there are some exceptional cases where it's not just a corner, but it's like a suburban condition on a cul-de-sac or something that has three sides um, where the fee starts being very high. Just like any ballot initiative, once passed, um, city council has the ability to adjust it and to, to adapt it. Um, and I'll, I'll point out a pretty dramatic example of that with the green roof initiative that was passed, you know, put on put on the ballot by uh, the citizens. It was voted on and it, and it, it was passed, but it, it was really unworkable. Um, and, and even the, the main proponent of it said it wasn't thoroughly thought through, um, but the intention was there. And then working with the city after it passed, they adapted, they, they, they shaved off the rough edges, they made it work better. Uh, in something that uh, for green building standards has done a lot to move things forward. I have no doubt um, that if this passes, um, city council will want to adjust for certain exceptional cases uh, where it just seems too high. Um, but um, I, I would just repeat that it can't be taken off the property owner's responsibility entirely because there's no magic source of money. Government money comes from us one way or another. The question is, how do we how do we spread it around? Uh, how do we spread around our contributions? Uh, Jill Logan Tori has put in the uh, chat um, that she's responded to many many of these questions. I'm not seeing any other hands up, but I'll just go through a couple of things in the chat. Miles uh, uh, Flagstone, yes, um, the sidewalk repair program that uh, Councilman Cashman has come to Transportation Committee and said, you know, frankly. It's been a failure. We talked a couple months ago at the delegates meeting with the uh, with the auditor's office, and they did a, 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 an audit that was pretty pointed about that repair program. One of the really good things about that repair program is they came to a consensus that when you've got flagstone, if it's intact, there's no reason to break that into pieces and throw it in the dumpster and replace it with concrete. If it's intact, you can pick it up, rearrange the sand, and put it back down. It's a durable piece of material that's lasted for 100 years. It can last for 100 more if it's just reset. So that has been adopted into this proposal. And then, um, and then uh, there was a question about tree roots. Yes, tree roots is one of the main things that can uh, disrupt sidewalks, but there are ways to uh, raise the nearby sidewalk, gently ramp it or root around uh, tree roots, or even use a soft material for a, a short distance over tree roots like a, um, um, what do, you, what do you call it, like they do for roadways, um, uh, tarmac, um, to get around that in a way that's safe for trees. But my, my, my request here is today that, I, that INC support this proposal because it point for point does what we've been asking for for so many years. And if there are some rough edges, if there are places where people have too much frontage, understanding that today they have that much exposure to that much sidewalk to repair, um, and it's uh, it's commensurate with us being proposed here, but it can be refined in the future. If this does not pass, we're going to be for more generations in a city full of incomplete broken sidewalks 
uh, that the most vulnerable of our community can't navigate because they have mobility issues, because they're young, because they're old. Okay, I, I'm gonna try and combine the last questions in here, but I think that we need to take the vote because again, as I said at the beginning, we have to respect our presenters and I have them on today for 940. So um, I'd like to move forward with the vote. Um, you know, and there was <clears throat> previous meetings, you can you can look at those um, meetings to see any of those. And, and you can always reach out to city council or anyone else afterward. Um, I think the, the there was a couple of questions just regarding um, I think there was, what did the committee do to kind of look at, you know, I, I think you've talked about a little bit of it, but kind of um, gentrification and issues with that um, and trying to work with issues of, you know, some neighborhoods. And I know if, if you get cited, you're going to have to pay the bill yourself, right? And finding your own personal contractor is going to cost you a lot more. So what I've heard is that this will bring in um, city contractors and they can have a better deal to um, replace gives them a, a benefit but but it will also limit the cost for residents and how much they pay for replacement or for new sidewalks um, but I think um, if we can go ahead and just ask what did the committee do to look at those disparities and gentrification and anything like that Oh, yes. And also the other question, just the final question was, you know, are um, um, developers and business owners charged a larger fee or is that the same? Uh, let me start at the end. Um, the the fee scales by essentially how how wide the sidewalk width should be. And so. Um, and so in business districts, quite often you have very wide sidewalks compared to a, a residential neighborhood where you might have a five or six foot sidewalk. So the fees in those areas um, for businesses where you typically have wide sidewalks are, are wider and it's a per linear foot, but at a, at a higher value. So they will be paying more because they have more sidewalk to maintain. Uh, developers, nothing in this prevents the city from continuing to require that when a new development is, is made, they they build their own sidewalks that's what's done now and, and nothing uh, nothing changes that in this proposal um, so we're not uh, being asked to bear a burden we don't already have for for development um, the gentrification topic is is one that you know a lot of people have a lot of different feelings about i certainly think that uh, it, it's it's evident that many low-income neighborhoods have much worse infrastructure of all sorts including sidewalks and those are the very neighborhoods where people are likely to walk more, use public transit more. So having basic infrastructure is as important or more important, but we've created it just the opposite. Um, so by having a modest fee, and there's a question in the chat, what's the average fee, Jill? I think it's about uh, $9 per month for an average lot on a residential block. And, and that, that average lot would be a residential street, uh, five or six foot sidewalk, uh, 50 foot wide, certainly some parts of town are narrower, some are wider, but this is sort of the Denver typical would turn out to be $9 a month. And that $9 a month would not only pay for repairing your sidewalks, but getting us all a city full of walkable, safe sidewalks. And then uh, additionally on the, on the gentrification on low income and the fact that the Nest neighborhoods we work closely with, uh, groups that are ag advocacy groups in the area of um, equity and looking at uh, impacts, it was it was the consensus that a reduction for nest neighborhoods of 20% was reasonable, and that means the rest of the city is paying slightly more, uh, um, and uh, that that seemed like the right trade off to give the most help to those who need the most help. All right, I'm going to cut off the discussion now because we're beyond time. So um, just in the matter of time, since we've discussed this at a couple of meetings now, you know, for our delegate meetings, and we've discussed it at a couple of um, um, committee meetings, I want to go ahead and um, ask, you know, if we have, a, we do have a motion on the floor. Um, and do, and, and Joel, can you put that back up? Certainly. And do we have a second for that motion? I'll second the motion. 
Okay, Emmett seconds the motion. Thank you, Emmett. Um, so again, here it is. I'm just going to read it quickly. Um, motion for the INC delegation. INC supports the Denver to Side Sidewalks ballot initi um, initiative. Sorry. <laughs> to refer to Denver voters um, the question of removing the responsibility for repairs from adjacent property owners and placing this responsibility on the city and establishing a dedicated fee to fund this work. INC urges all members RNOs, all member RNOs to support this important issue. All right, that's the motion on the floor. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask for those of you um, who, and Joel, if you can stop sharing so I can look at the screen. So those of you who are delegate members, you are a delegate from your RNO, your RNO is a paid um, member to INC, you can vote on this issue. So I'd like to have those of you, and then I'll try and get those on the phone. Um, those of you in person, if you can go to... Um, the reactions and raise your hand. I prefer a raised hand because those stay on longer. So raise your hand. Um, if you want to go to your name, you can also do it there. So go ahead and raise your hand if you're um, in favor of this. So go ahead and let's let's get all those in favor to raise your hands. Okay, those of you on the phone, any of those of you on the phone? Um, let me start with the 303956. Are you in favor? Yeah, yes. I think that's Adrian. You are a delegate. Um, th the other person on the phone that I see is 303503. Um, are you a delegate? And I don't know who you may be if you're voting. Okay, I'm going to go on with that. So, so Okay, have, you can lower 14. your hands now. Okay, we, it, I saw 14 showing plus one on the phone. Is that what you Right, got? correct. That's what I got. Thank you. All right, all of those who had your hands raised, please go ahead and lower your hands. I'm gonna wait for all hands to be lowered. All right, okay, those opposed to this motion, please raise your hands. Okay, those opposed to the motion, please raise your hand. Anybody on the phone, are you opposed to this motion? Hi, this is Joanna. May I ask a question really quick for clarification? Sure. Um, does the widening of the sidewalk um, permit bikers to use it or is bikers for the, um, I believe it's called the, uh, Right, right away. Is that the street or the sidewalk? Uh, bikes do not belong on sidewalks, and and city council has, uh, in the recent past, clarified that bikes and scooters, the scooter share, that kind of thing, belong in the streets. And if there is a bike lane, they should use that. Uh, okay, great, thank you. Um, all right, we had one opposed. Any any um, opposition? Go ahead. And I want to see if there's any, sorry, any abstentions. Sorry about that. All right. We have nine abstentions. Okay. How many do we have uh, in favor? We have 15 in favor, one opposed, and nine abstentions. So the okay. motion carries. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and. Um, yeah, th thank you all. And the, the INC Transportation Committee with all the work people have put into this. Thanks you as well. Um, please, please look at uh, denversidewalks.com for all the information about this, including FAQs and handouts and 
places you can go sign a, a petition because we're not yet on the ballot. Uh, you just need to get enough petition signatures by essentially the 4th of July. Thanks. Uh, Loretta, you may be on mute. We're not hearing anything. Oh, did Loretta drop? Is our vice chair on? Sorry, sorry, is Loretta there? This is Drew. Yeah, I don't know if she just had a power outage or what, because um, she just dropped. I'm trying oh. to make a phone call. If you want to take yeah, over. Yeah, you want to lead us to the, to the next item? Oh, okay, sorry, everybody, and thanks, Joel. This is Drew Dutcher, the vice president. I'll take over, I guess, until Loretta comes back. I don't have the, met the agenda in front of me, and I'm sorry for that. Um, does someone have that? Uh, I can try to find it in my email, but I think we have presenters, so I'm sorry if they're waiting. Um, uh, um, Drew, it's Nicole Kim from Excise and License, I believe. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so do we have a presentation from them? And yes. uh, can someone allow them to share their share their screen? It's um, already been done. Hi, good morning. I was trying to um, decide if I should jump in or give you another minute because I wasn't sure if I was next. I'm Nicole. Hi. Um, Nicole Kim, I'm with uh, Denver Department of Excise and Licenses, and I am the uh, residential rental program manager. Um, so I am going to go ahead and try to share my screen. Let me see if I can get that here. Um, Great. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I wasn't sure if um, you wanted me to wait. Just no, to you're good. Sorry about, sorry about that. Okay, go ahead, Nicole. So I'm going to give an overview of the residential rental license program today. Um, let me just get, sorry, I'm not good on Zoom. I'm better on Teams. Uh, so let me just move this here a little bit. I, and of course I'm on my um, laptop, so I'm always a little bit like not in the right. Here we go. Um, okay, so you guys can see my screen here. Looks great, thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, so again, Nicole Kim uh, with Department of Excise and Licenses, and this is the Residential Rental License Program Overview. Um, this is a license that is new this year, um, required for rentals of 30 days or longer. So uh, short-term rentals is, you know, the different program that's kind of more related to like Airbnbs or VRBOs and things like that. Um, I believe Erica Rogers from uh, my team is on as well, and she'll answer questions about that program um, at the end of this presentation. Um, so just keep in mind, this is for 30 days or longer. So this is like apartments, um, a condo that you rent out, maybe if you own like a single family home that you rent um, and you live somewhere else, things like that. Um, so the residential rental license program uh, was developed um, and was an ordinance uh, that Council President Stacey Gilmore uh, championed. Uh, the goals of the program are to ensure the minimum housing standards of rental units are maintained, uh, considering the welfare, safety, and health of those residing in them. Um, the program also is looking to accurately track city housing stock, including rentals, um, and then also identifying the types of rentals that we have. So single family homes, duplexes, townhomes, things like that. Um, currently, there's not any program that really tracks those numbers or types. Um, and then we're also collecting some basic information about um, those uh, rentals. And then lastly, to um, obtain and utilize contact information um, so that city resources can be shared with rental property owners and tenants. 
And then also to uh, look to kind of strengthen the landlord and tenant education and those, uh, you know, channels and mediums. Uh, this was something that was really identified during the pandemic was, um, you know, the lack of contact information so that our resources could be shared from the city side. Um, the residential rental license uh, conducted, or um, sorry, the outreach um, included an advisory group. <clears throat> they met uh, biweekly from July to September of 2021. Um, we did listen in to that and just kind of uh, get some perspective and hear, you know, the perspectives from um, stakeholders. The stakeholders included um, inspection industry professionals, uh, property owners, uh, members from nonprofit organizations, other community associations. Um, we also had some tenants and just community members. Um, the residential rental advisory group uh, primarily focused on, or did not primarily, primarily and not focused on the inspection checklist um, and what was gonna be included on that checklist. And then also proposed some questions and other program requirements that we took into consideration uh, when building out those materials. And I'll go over the checklist in just a little bit here. Um, the, some important dates to consider. So this license is a phased implementation. So right now we're in what we're considering to be um, kind of like a voluntary compliance phase for 2022. Um, and But beginning January 1 of 2022, uh, there is a requirement for landlords to provide a written lease and also a copy of the Den Denver Tenant Rights and Resources document. Um, this is a document that outlines some uh, basic information for tenants and landlords about what your rights and responsibilities are. It covers things like um, if you need assistance and some of the different programs that you might want to find or look into. Um, and then also it covers um, things like, you know, eviction processes and uh, what you have rights to and uh, things like paying rent and what types of income is accepted and uh, provisions around income discrimination prevention. Um, so that is required now. And then we do have the online application, which is available um, for licensing that became available in March of this year. Um, beginning January 1 of 2023, all multi-unit properties will need to have a license. And then beginning January 1 of 2024, all single unit properties will need to have a license. So again, kind of phasing that in, um, identifying, you know, the different properties and types. I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, kind of how we make that, just, uh, how we uh, differentiate those. Um, so again, related to the property information, so single unit properties require an individual license. So this will be, again, like a single family home. Um, you'll get one license for that property. For multi-unit properties, a single license can be issued for multiple addresses or structures if they're all located on a single parcel or contiguous parcels and under the same ownership. So what that would look like is if you have a duplex and you own both of them, um, and they could either be on one parcel or two parcels next to each other. Um, this would also cover like an entire apartment complex um, if they had multiple buildings, either on one parcel or spanning multiples. And then this also um, captures more like suburban type context um, apartment facilities where they may have multiple buildings spanning, you know, multiple blocks and across different right of ways. So um, if you're a single unit, you get one license, or if you have multiples, that would be um, you could be under one license. And this is just for that property. So we do wanna be a little bit careful to remind folks that if you have one property, say like in Central Park neighborhood and then something else up in the Highlands, those are two separate properties. Um, but we could issue you know, one license for each if there's multiple units on that property. Um, we are gonna ask for additional addresses and address details uh, to be documented on both the inspection checklist and the application. So we're really trying to advise um, property owners and inspectors to understand, you know, kind of your license setup and what units you have and are going to be rented. Uh, so we'll ask for those details both when they document the inspection checklist information and then on the application. Um, there is an inspection requirement. Um, inspections are required. And I'll talk a little bit more about those on the next slide here. Um, so firstly, only inspectors who meet the qualifications established in the ordinance can perform the residential rental inspections. To perform the residential rental property inspections, an inspector has to hold one of these three um, certifications. So they have to be certified by either American Society of Home Inspectors, in an International Society of Certified Home Inspectors, or be a master, uh, master certified inspector. So they have to have one of those. And then they also have to hold 
a combination designation from the International Code Council, and that can be the R5, C5, or C8. Um, they, so they have to have one, and then also everyone has to have one of the ICC certifications. Um, we are uh, maintaining a list of qualified inspectors on our website. That's just um, for property owners and managers if they want to do research. This is inspectors who are self-certifying that they meet those qualifications. Uh, we do suggest, you know, that property owners and managers uh, definitely vet, you know, the inspectors that they're looking at and verify those qualifications before they um, have them conduct the inspections. Um, so inspections have to be completed for 10% of the total number of units. So let's say if you have 100 units, it'll be 10 units. If you have 200, it'll be 20 or um, at least one. So between one and 15 units, you'd have one inspection. Um, when you have multiples, the units should be randomly selected by the inspector using some sort of a random number generator. So obviously, if you have two units, you know, they could just flip a coin or something like that. Um, but there are random unit generators uh, that can be used that are online. You can just search for that. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, there is a checklist and all checklist items apply to all units. So this would include any common areas and shared utilities. Um, so we are advising that, you know, again, folks plan ahead and understand the requirements, both of the checklist and also the setup of their property. There may be some things that perhaps are locked or, you know, you need to request permission from your HOA or something like that in order to get these inspections. Um, so the che inspection checklist form, it is on our website. This is based on the residential health code. Uh, the inspection checklist guidebook provides kind of more additional information and context as far as some measurements or um, interpretation of the different items on the checklist. And then in, in addition to the checklist, uh, properties must comply with all existing codes. So nothing on the checklist supersedes uh, zoning, fire, or building codes, and things like that. Um, related to re-inspections, so if uh, someone goes through the inspection and they have items on their checklist which are noted as non-compliant, you can get a re-inspection and then we have a process outlined in the guidebook for how those re-inspections are submitted. Um, once you have your initial inspection, the application needs to be submitted within 90 days. And then if you do have those non-compliant um, items, you have 90 days after you submit your application to get those corrected and resubmit that uh, re-inspection form. Again, this is just super high level and kind of quick, but uh, we do have that process outlined in our guidebook. Um, and then just again, related to the inspection. So the costs are set by the inspectors or the inspection companies. These are third party private inspectors, you know, who hold those qualifications. Um, we've gotten some general information and feedback. There was also some information in Council President uh, Gilmore's outreach documents, you know, where they collected some information related to some rough estimates of costs and things like that. Um, property owners and managers can utilize the inspector list um, to find that qualified inspector. Again, those are just inspectors who are self-certifying or self-reporting that they hold those qualifications. Um, and we do ask that the inspectors remain current on their cert uh, certifications. The licenses once issued are valid for four years unless ownership changes. So um, if you either sell the property or if there's changes to the ownership structure, like say the, you know, the property management company changes, uh, the licenses are not transferable. So that would require new inspections and a new license um, and any other change to the property. So let's say you change the number of units that you're offering or something like that, um, you would have to obtain a new license. Otherwise, they're valid for four years. Um, and that's all I have, again, just a very, very general, broad overview. I did provide, um, you know, my contact information in our uh, website if you want to look into, you know, more detail. Um, I wasn't exactly sure who the audience, you know, was going to be here and what kind of questions you guys would have. So I didn't want to go too far into any of the, you know, rabbit holes of the program, but happy to um, answer any questions. And again, I would direct um, you to review all the information on our website because we have quite a bit of information there. Um Thanks, Nicole. Sorry I dropped off, everyone. Um, I think I accidentally hit leave. I'm not sure what happened. Anyway, I'm back again. Um, thanks again and 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 welcome. Um, I did have one question. Why four years? Um, so the idea around the four years, I think, is just again trying to minimize the impact and cost, you know, to owners. Um, hoping that you get your inspection done and nothing really changes much within the property. So if you would think of like a house that you rent, perhaps um, 
likely to maintain the same conditions over a period of time, not really necessary to have an inspection every year. You know, there, we were, I think there was the assumption made that there wouldn't be frequent changes to the property. Um, and again, just to kind of try to minimize the impacts to um, owners and managers. Okay, two other questions. Um, Bruce asked, did he read that there are currently only four inspectors licensed? I thought these are <coughs> a broad range. So um, we are, I guess, having a little bit of a challenge with making sure that there are enough qualified inspectors. There are the two certifications which are required. Again, you have to hold either the OSHI, InterNACHI, or Certified Master Inspector certification. And then you also have to have the ICC certification. Um, generally, home inspectors uh, will have a home inspector certification. And then this ICC is kind of um, a dual certification is what we're referring to it as. Um, and it's more related to code compliance and um, understanding new construction and some different challenges, you know, that may exist. Um, so what we're working on is, you know, outreach and uh, sharing information with stakeholder groups, you know, everyone from property owners, managers, um, folks like you, and then, you know, inspection uh, industry members. We're also working with a few um, groups uh, such as like Work Now through CCD, uh, we're working through the Denver Workforce Centers and a few others to try to make sure that, you know, interested people know about this and go get those certifications so that they conduct inspections. Um, but it is true. Actually, unfortunately, we only have three inspectors right now. But again, those are only the inspectors who have self-reported that they are on this list. Um, they don't have to be on the list to conduct the inspections. It's just meant to be kind of a tool for, you know, people as a starting off place to research uh, finding an inspector. All right. Um, clarifying question. I think, Emmett, um, you said how much are the licenses? Do you want to ask that question directly? Because I'm, I'm, I thought that was discussed. So go ahead. It was discussed. I missed it. Uh, how much are the licenses? Yeah, so the licenses, there's um, there's actually a tiered system. If you want, I can pull it up on our website um, so that you can take a look at that. Um, but basically, it's about $50 a unit um, for the first. Uh, sorry, I'm going to explain this confusing. It's a little bit easier if we just look at it really quick here. Um, and then there is, so there's an application fee and a license fee. Um, and again, it's dependent on the number of units. Oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong page. And then the other cost, you know, to just keep in mind um, is that there is the uh, cost associated with the inspections and those are not set by the city. Those are set by the individuals. Um, but you can see kind of the tiered structure here. So it depends on the number of units that you have. And then there's also the application fee. There is a discounted application fee right now. So in 2022, the fee for application is reduced from 50 to 25 for multi-unit properties. And um, in 2023, that will remain for single unit properties as well. So if you opt in basically the year before you have to, you get that discounted application fee. Okay, there's another question from Miles, a couple of questions. Um, will these permits be cross-referenced with approved permitted improvements? And what if rental improvements, sorry, we switched to a different place. What if rental, sorry. Oh, sorry, I, I saw in the chat that someone was still seeing the PowerPoint. So I just wanted to share that okay. in there, sorry. Okay, so first question, will these permits be cross-referenced with approved permitted improvements? And two, what if rental improvements have not been approved by the city? Um, okay, so the way I understand that question, so um, when inspectors go out to a property, they're not going to necessarily do um, research on have the, you know, have the property owners pulled permits to do anything. Uh, there is in the ordinance, it's specifically stated that you have to comply with all fire building and zoning codes as well. Um, but they're just going to be looking for the checklist items. And I can share the checklist if you want. Otherwise, it is on our website. Um, and as far as any like unpermitted construction, um, that would kind of follow the normal channel. So if a complaint was received, you know, by CPD, they would go out and do their investigation. Um, we have suggested that, for example, let's say an inspector goes out to um, a house or an 
department, they say this looks really bad or, you know, like something is just not quite right. There are, you know, um, channels where folks can uh, submit, you know, a complaint and then they'll go out and investigate that. But um, this is not related to permits, although permits could be required if you have to make improvements. So again, when they look at those checklist items, let's say they have to improve something uh, related to a stairway or um, electrical upgrades, they do have to pull permits for that. So this does not supersede any of those other processes. It just kind of ties in with normal existing building processes. I'm not sure if that answered the question exactly. If you well, and I think this kind of, I think you might have answered this in that because there was a follow up with that. What happens if ADU sizes, I don't understand because if it's permitted, if permitted ADU is larger than zoning allows, um, I think that's a CPD thing. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So again, um, have to be in compliance with building fire and zoning codes. There's nothing on the checklist that is related to zoning. Um, the checklist is based on residential health and housing, uh, you know, codes and uh, rules. So if there's something related to like a setback or um, number of units or things like that, we would refer those to zoning if we did have questions and they would follow their process, you know, where they would send out um, one of their inspectors and investigate that. Uh, one other question. Um, these are all in the chat. I don't know if anybody has their hands raised because I can't see that yet. But the inspection checklist has changed since it was first issues. Why did they change it? And can we anticipate future changes? Yeah, so there were a few changes made to the checklist. Um, a couple of clarifications on some of the technical items and then also some uh, kind of cleanup of like some admin type uh, items for our processing more than anything. Uh, we identified that there were a few things that we thought were clear but seemed to be a little bit confusing and we just felt we could do a little bit better. Um, we did send a bulletin through our uh, residential rental bulletin to update uh, that the, you know, the checklist has been updated and to say, you know, this is what's changed. I would uh, suggest that if any of you are not signed up for that, uh, you know, please go ahead and do so. We're sharing out information pretty regularly. Um, and to the question of can we anticipate future changes? Ideally, no. We are looking to kind of have that pretty set. Um, any changes to the checklist? would have to be approved by uh, the manager of DDPG. And we do have uh, basically a you know stakeholder group that we would engage if any changes needed to be made. So we really don't wanna do that either. Um, again, maybe some admin you know, type uh, formatting, th you know, things like that, those would be small and we may have those. Um, I don't see any of those on the radar. Uh, we have also made some updates to the guidebook. And again, whenever we do that, we just share it out in a bulletin to say, you know, this is what's changed. Um, we also note, uh, you know, obviously a version and we note the specific changes that were made and on what date. Okay. The, another question kind of follow on is how many units have currently been inspected? How many passed or failed? And Carrie also asks if a unit cannot satisfy requirements like two apartments with a shared bath is, you know, are those issues? Um, okay, so how many units have been inspected? We actually don't know because again, these are third party inspectors. So um, we know and there are, <clears throat> there were some figures uh, that Council President Gilmore used during her, um, you know, kind of outreach and um, engagement sessions where potentially there's about 50,000 properties, you know, that are rentals in Denver. So we think that this is going to be quite large um, over the next few years. Right now, we haven't seen a ton of applications. I think we're at maybe 80, 82, 85, something like that as of the last time I checked. And we generally won't see the failed inspections. Um, ideally, we are suggesting to property owners and managers to submit to us when you have a passing checklist. So we want all of the items either passing on the first go round or addressed with that re-inspection and then submitted to us. Um, you do have to keep in mind that 90 day time frame. Again, once you have your inspection, you have 90 days to submit an application. If you do have to make corrections, you could submit that application and have another 90 days for the reinspection. Um, so we don't know how many have been done right now, um, or you know how many people are kind of in the pipeline or scheduled with inspectors. 
I have kind of suggested that this is an interesting license in that there's kind of this whole pre-work time, you know, where folks are either contacting inspectors, making improvements to their property, um, you know, getting in touch with their HOA to schedule a time when they may be able to have an inspector um, come into the boiler room or the furnace room and things like that. So there's kind of this whole pre-work element that we don't really have a, you know, we don't really have insight into until we see those actual applications or until we get feedback. Can you stop sharing your screen, please? I can't uh -huh. let people in and, and that sort of thing. And I can't see whose hands are raised. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, great. Um, sorry, I'm not sure if I was completely done with that question. If there's follow-up, just let me know. So you talked about whether folks, um, you know, don't know how many people have been approved. And then there was the issue of the shared bathroom. Um. You know, I'm not really sure about the shared bathroom. Um, so we do have a definition of a dwelling unit um, in our guidebook and on our website, but I believe, you know, they would have to have their own entrance and kitchen and restroom facilities. So this doesn't apply to like dorms or, you know, college housing or, um, you know, a shelter or something like that. So I'm not really sure where there would be shared bathrooms. Um, if I'm missing something, though, maybe if whoever asked. OK, that, thanks. I mean, you know, there's other sorts of units. I mean, clearly there's, you know, the city's approved, um, you know, those more dorm like kind of issues. So, I mean, I'm assuming that could be if it was. That sort of thing, but I'm going to go ahead and go on to Christine. OK, thanks, Loretta. Um, so my question's a little different. This is all interesting, but I. Just going back to listening to um, Councilwoman Gilmore and her aide presenting on this a few years ago, one of the main prompts for this was that DDPHE and others were having difficulty tracking out-of-state owners, tracking investment companies, landlords, and the records were really, you know, complicated. So I'm just interested if you've seen, if there's been a, if it's clear that it's less difficult now to track the electrical violation and get to the owner, et cetera. Has this helped? Do you see a difference? Does DDPHE see a difference? Um, so as I mentioned, this is one of the program goals, right? Is to collect contact information for property owners and managers. Um, we are still in the voluntary compliance phase, you know, so at the, at the end of 2024, when base, or, you know, in 2024, when basically everyone should have a license, I think that we'll have, um, or we should have a very, very good list of contact information for property owners and managers. Um, right now, again, we only have 80 some applications submitted so far, but we are collecting as a part of every application, contact information for property owners, managers, um, and an on-site contact. So it's it really in infancy, the complete- It is, yeah. I mean, the voluntary compliance phase in 2022, we are doing no enforcement yet. And even in 2023, the requirement is only for multi-unit properties. It's not until 2024 that single units have to obtain the license. Yeah. Um, but that is one of the goals. And um, if anybody wants to you know, have an offline conversation about specifically what we're collecting for you know, contact information, I'd be happy to share that out as well. Um, like I said, you can share my email and you know, reach out to me directly. I'm happy to have more of a conversation about that. Pete did, Pete, did you still have a question? Um, I was just going to ask about, um, you mentioned current code, um, and I'm assuming that properties built, uh, it'll just need to match the code that they were built in. You know, something built in the 70s isn't going to have to retrofit uh, all of their outlets with uh, GFCI breakers or something like that. but. Uh, um, so different than codes, you know, building codes, mm -hmm. properties do have to comply with the inspection checklist. And so right. um, I shared that before, but I would advise, you know, that folks take a look at the checklist. There are requirements for electrical, and this is regardless of the year that they were built. Those are the minimum housing standards that you do have to comply with. Right. Makes sense. Thanks. Okay. What, a couple other questions in the chat. So there was a question about, and I don't know if you know this because they're private, right? How much are inspectors charging for inspections and is the reinspection if necessary at a reduced cost? 
Um, so we have heard some information, um, you know, some feedback about the cost of inspections that they're about $200 a unit. But again, this is just, we've heard that as like a throw it out there kind of statement. Um, we've advised folks to, you know, do their research and, you know, the same as you would when you're hiring any type of, you know, person to do something at your home or your property. And then I'm sorry, I didn't hear the second part of the question. There was the cost. And then what else was the other one? Um, oh, reinspection Is it reduced? I don't know if you know that. You know, I wouldn't know that again. Um, I would say if you want to contact the inspectors who are, you know, on our website um, or others, you know, and just reach out to them and see what, you know, what they're charging. All right. Uh, a couple other questions and then we'll move on. What happens in cases of non-compliance where a property fails inspection or does not rectify correct violations? Um, so I guess I'm not sure I understand correctly. So if they cannot comply with the checklist, they would not be able to obtain a license and they would not be able to continue renting their unit. I mean, that's the ultimate kind of, I guess, end of the line there. Um, there are processes obviously for, you know, again, obtaining building permits, making corrections to your property. Um, and if someone wanted to, there is information um, around applying for a variance from checklist items. Uh, those do go to the um, DDPHE Board of Health to review those. Um, and it's a process that, you know, we're not necessarily um, advocating folks, you know, to take because uh, the, you know, the standards are pretty uh, stringent to meet those to obtain a variance. Um, okay, a couple of, couple of notes. Um, property owners who live in, and I'm just reading what you wrote so that people on lot, who are on phone can, can see this or aren't looking at the chat. Property owners who live on site and rent a space or room that does not have its own kitchen, bathroom, accessory dwelling units and basement apartments with a separate entrance, kitchen and full bathroom are required to obtain a license. Boarding homes, um, personal care boarding homes and non-governmental residential facilities for the treatment or supervision of offenders, hotels, rooming houses and short-term rentals these likely require a different type of license, see chapter 33, lodging information for additional information on um, information regarding these license type. Um, so that's helpful. Thank you very much for that. Um, the other thing is someone asked, do you have a checklist? Can Is there a checklist or a link you could share? I can do that. Yep. I just popped in the, um, those are uh, the piece that you read, that's off of our FAQ page. And that was just to clarify on who's not required to get a license, um, kind of back to that like shared uh, restroom yeah. or, you know, uh, boarding type facility. So let me share the um, link to the checklist. And then um, I did see that someone put their contact info to ask for something. I'm not sure exactly what. Um, so I'm trying to keep up with the chat and be um, mindful of answering the questions here. So here's the link to the checklist. And then um, on the same landing page basically is where we have our guidebook. So I'll share the um, you know link to that as well. That provides again some additional context and information, um, interpretations of you know some of the different um, items that inspectors are looking for. Um, And it looks page? like I think Pete's put in a um he put in the he says it's the landing page. So we have a couple of things in there. So that's helpful. Um if those are correct, you know, Kim, let us know. Um, but this is this is helpful information. Does anybody have any more questions? We have just a couple minutes and then I I hope. Lamone, I don't know if you've seen our next presenters. I'm trying to look in the. Uh, Loretta, I've had my hand up for a while. Oh, sorry. I'm on a different page. Okay, go ahead, Miles. Just a few quick questions, Nicole, from what you just said. Thanks for presenting. So what it sounds like is the inspectors are just inspecting the units to meet the um, health and wellness criteria, safety. So if I had an illegal ADU that was never claimed but it had been improved, um, it would it could basically get permitted even though it didn't meet any zoning. So so if somebody had built something, 
they could basically get a permit for it and rent it out, correct? Because it isn't cross-referenced with zoning. Um, so I, I'm trying to understand the scenario here. So it, you're saying if there's an illegally existing ADU right now, um, they and they're renting it out, what would we do about that? Is that what your question is? Basically, Correct. Because the inspector is just going to look at, does it meet the criteria for uh, renting? Yeah. So again, we would basically be advising property owners that if we became aware of that situation, we would say, uh, you know, we would refer it to our partners in zoning and say, you know, do you want to do um, an investigation on this? If one of our partner agencies, so CPD or DDPHE or, um, you know, Denver Fire or anyone else found um, that they weren't compliant with those other codes, like I mentioned, so building fire zoning code, they could notify us and we would go through um, basically the revocation or, you know, show cause process for the license. And we could revoke the license if we became aware of a situation like that. But you said there's no cross-referencing with uh, planning. So how, how would the city know it was illegal? Um, so we do ask for, you know, an address on the application. So they would need a valid address. So there are some processes kind of on the front end here, whenever you're going to do anything to a property um, where we're, you know, we're hoping that those are going to identify any of these situations. I think that, um, you know, right now, again, we're focusing on outreach, uh, program awareness, you know, and making sure that um, people understand that this is a requirement. Um, if there were certain situations that, you know, they were kind of like getting through somehow, we would probably do more due diligence to make sure that we were capturing those. Um, ideally, those, you know, if we became aware of them, again, that would be when we would address them. As far as a situation where, let's say, someone is um, just not complying with zoning laws, not complying with building laws, not complying with, you know, the license requirement. Again, I think that there's a lot of different processes where we're going to try to capture those from one way or another. Um, one other piece that I should mention here too, is there's also the, um, the DDPHE complaint process. So let's say you were either the tenant or a neighbor or something like that. Those are kind of the way that they would be identified or that's the way they would be identified right now. And that will still exist under the license process. Yes, but the inspector will not be providing any paperwork work to the city for, for anyone to cross-reference. I, I guess where this is going is, so currently ADUs have a size limit if it's in the main structure or separate. So if I had a bungalow that was a thousand up and a thousand down and I had converted the basement to an ADU, which was a thousand three bedroom uh, ADU, that would actually go against zoning because the ADU is too large, but you don't have, you won't have any data that will show that it's too large. And then the next question is, is so then I could actually, if I was improving a property, I could say, I'm going to build three ADUs down there and it's against zoning, and, but I can get it inspected and it will pass, but I can, I can create income by doing that. And the city would have no way of knowing, correct? Yeah, so I mean, I definitely understand where you're going with this piece here. So the license is not intended to, you know, enforce zoning laws. Zoning does have processes in place. Um, you know, the building department and zoning address this challenge all the time related to illegally established units, um, unpermitted construction. The license requirement is that they have to meet minimum housing standards for their rental units. They comply with the checklist. And again, um, there are avenues, you know, for inspectors either to provide us feedback for tenants, landlords, um, neighbors, and others, you know, to provide feedback to the city to identify these types of properties. Um, and as we work through our enforcement processes, you know, in 2023, 2024, 2025 ongoing, um, we will be looking at, say, you know, mailing lists for uh, property owners for their physical versus mailing address um, to identify, you know, where are these locations and, um, you know, doing enforcement as obviously as we identify those. So the main goal of the license is not to enforce zoning regulations, though. The main goal of the license is to enforce minimum housing standards. and rental OK, use. so so just a quick follow up and this is where it all kind of ends is. So if, if I had built some illegal ADUs in my house and I can get a, I get a permit and the city's now permitting me to rent them out, doesn't that make that illegal, those illegal ADUs legal because I've gotten city this, a permit for it. So therefore it's grandfathered in. Do you see what I'm saying? 
So when you obtain a building permit, one thing they are going to ask for is a zoning permit. So you wouldn't be able to go to, say, the building department and apply for a permit for, you know, I don't know, whatever you're going to do. Um, they would verify the zoning at that time. Again, that's a process that exists today. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking on my phone here to try to get, um, I was going to include the ordinance language, but basically, again, the ordinance language for the residential rental license does not supersede anything that's in the building or zoning code or um, building zoning or fire code. You still have to comply with those. So I certainly understand that this challenge around illegal units exists today. I don't know that that's uh, that the license is primarily focused on addressing that. I certainly understand and appreciate, you know, where you're going with this conversation. However, you know, we're kind of in the licensing lane here. There's processes that address um, illegally established, you know, dwelling units. Okay, yeah, no, I, I'm just talking about that, the oddball units, because I guess the, the question really is, if I, if, if an owner was to get the permit and rent it out, and then later you find out it's illegal, wouldn't the owner with the illegal ADUs have a premise to say, well, you've allowed me to rent it for these many years, how can you come back and tell me they're illegal? because I've been paying or, or I've been renting them. I guess, I guess that's the main question. Um, yeah, again, so in the ordinance, and I'm sorry, I'm having such a hard time. I'm not- Okay, we're, we're, we're done with this topic. So, and I'm gonna move us on. So Miles, you can take it offline right now. Okay, so, so you guys can communicate. Um, Nicole, if you're gonna stay on, that would be great. So if you guys want to keep this topic going or exchange information, but we're going to move on to our next because I need to roll this along, okay? Um, so why don't we go ahead and, and if you want to respond to his question on the, um, in, in chat, perfect. Um, otherwise, we're going to move on to our next topic because I want to make sure that we're respecting people and we don't lose folks, okay? Thank you very much for that presentation. If you can send us um the link we could we could post you know the the you know um a link to that and have people go ahead and reach out and be able to access that okay um i want to go on to Lamone. do you want to introduce our two next speakers i will thank you uh my name is Lamone knowles i'm president of the east denver residents council and I want to introduce the next two speakers who it's a good segue on the conversation about ADUs. Um, the first is Josh Palmieri. He's a senior planner and uh, ADU project manager with the city and county of Denver. Uh, the second speaker is Sean Johnson. He is a resident of Sunnyside. Uh, he's also a member of the ADU Community Advisory Committee, and he has a very good personal story about his experience trying to get an ADU um, built on his property. So um, for right now, Josh, I'm going to hand this over to you. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks for that introduction, Lamon. Welcome. Um, I'm Josh Palmieri, Senior City Planner and I'm project managing the ADUs in Denver project. I'll try to keep it brief. I think we went a little long with that last topic, so I'd like to really get into the discussion, but I've got a few slides just to update everybody on what we're working on here and what this project is about. Uh, so hopefully everyone knows by now what an ADU is uh, on this call. Uh, it is accessory to a primary structure, self-contained living space can be attached or detached, uh, but the important note here is that it has to be accessory to something. It is a use, a defined use, and that use is only allowed to be currently uh, allowed as accessory to a primary single unit dwelling use. Um, what's definitely not in this project is we're not actually rezoning any parts of the city to allow ADUs through this project. We know there's a lot of interest in that but we've heard that there's just not quite enough political will to do that uh, as far as a full citywide legislative rezoning. So we're not taking that on in this project. If your property does not allow an ADU today, this project will not enable it to do so. We do have plan language in Blueprint Denver that says that ADU should be allowed everywhere, but we are currently leaving that process up to those individual property owners to come forward and rezone their properties or also we're leaving it up to city council members uh, to do larger citywide or legislative rezonings. 
So what is in this project is this idea of removing barriers to accessory dwelling unit construction. Uh, we're looking at where the zoning regulations are getting in the way of good outcomes, potentially more affordable outcomes, things like that. And we're looking really closely at this idea of context. And so making sure that ADUs do fit into different types of neighborhoods throughout the city, uh, specifically like our suburban context neighborhoods where they don't have alleys that exist or their lot size shapes are a bit different. So this project will end up in a Revisions to the Denver Zoning Code will propose recommendations to City Council for approval, uh, which will dictate the future size, shape, and location uh, of ADUs. You know, why we're doing this work, we, we know that the way folks are living is changing. COVID's really shown a light on the, the need for a little bit more space, potentially, but especially more housing. Uh, we like the idea that Folks are interested in flexibility on their property. And so you can live in the main house, rent out the ADU, live in both, potentially move into the ADU in the future and rent out the main house. And so it's a way for folks to really uh, grow their property, grow into their investment, but also remain in place. Uh, we like some of the programs that things like the WDRC are doing where they're helping folks remain and prosper in their neighborhoods. They're actually helping place uh, lower income tenants on their property with the help of Habitat for Humanity construction, low income loans to uh, really help them reinvest in their property and stay in an established neighborhood that they know and love. We're also looking at creating um, new and missing housing options. We know a lot of neighborhoods uh, don't have anything besides single unit. A lot of times those homes are three and four bedrooms and we know that more housing options uh, need to exist where people want to live in these established communities. <clears throat> right now, I mean, the cheapest, smallest parcel in Denver, smallest lot size is selling for a quarter of a million dollars. And so we know ADUs have a benefit as far as not having a land cost associated with them. Uh, they are square footage limited in size. So you can only build a, up to a thousand square foot ADU on our biggest lot sizes. Uh, 650 and 865 are our two other thresholds. Uh, we think it's an efficient use of our resources. You know, we want to use the same roads and infrastructure that we already have. It feels like a more sustainable thing to do to infill where we can. And typically ADUs, for what we're seeing for now, the uh, they're built by the current property owners. We're not seeing investors trying to uh, buy up properties and put an ADU on there. The profit margins are just a little bit too slim and it's more of a long-term investment. Uh, there's definitely interest, you know, people are becoming more interested in ADUs. We've seen a steady increase since we sort of re-legalized them in 2010. Uh, permits are coming in, you know, rezoning, there's interest in, in doing so to their property and especially in those uh, suburban context neighborhoods. So in this project, we're trying to get a little bit ahead of the rush, uh, but you can see the uptick in permits year over year, small blip uh, in 2020 due to COVID, but with everything else, it's picking back up again. You know, we know Denver's still popular, it's still growing. So we've grown by roughly 115,000 people in the last decade, looking at potentially another 150,000 people in the next 20 years. And so we think ADUs are just one piece of the puzzle to help create some of those housing options and uh, absorb some of the increase in population that is coming. And of course, as you all know, we are in you know, quite the housing crisis. Uh, Denver is quoted to be short about 50 to 60,000 housing units. Uh, we're also becoming one of the most expensive cities in the country. And so we know ADUs can't solve this uh, entirely, but we definitely think it's one part of the solution and we'd love to address some of these things uh, through accessory dwellings. So all this language, uh, this guidance comes from Blueprint Denver, which you know came through the comp plan. I'm sure lots of folks on the call are familiar or participated in those uh, processes, but this project is directly implementing land use recommendation five from, uh, from Blueprint Denver, which says very clearly to remove barriers to constructing accessory dwelling units, but also create those context sensitive form standards. Uh, it also says to revise the code to allow ADUs to be accessory to more uses than just single unit homes. So we're looking at allowing ADUs 
uh, as accessory to duplexes or row homes and things like that. So maybe a little bit smaller scale. We have to work out some of the details of what that looks like, but this is what we're tasked with for the project. Uh, we know ADUs have always been a, a part of Denver. You know, there's great historic examples throughout the city, places like Baker, Curtis Park. Uh, they've been around since Denver was a place. So we don't think that it's something that's necessarily out of character, but definitely is a part of Denver's history. Uh, we hear a lot of quotes about, you know, where ADUs are allowed. A lot of things are thrown out there. And technically, yes, ADUs are allowed in any zone district that's greater than two unit. So if you can build a duplex there, but you only have a single unit home on that property, you are allowed uh, an accessory dwelling unit. But any higher intensity district also includes places like downtown Denver. You can see all the red in the middle is places like the 16th Street Mall. And we know that, you know, folks aren't exactly building ADUs there because they don't quite make sense. People are interested in building ADUs, you know, on their property, on their single unit home, uh, their zone lot where they live. So here's a little bit more of an accurate map of what that looks like. Here's all of the single unit districts in Denver. So all of the blue is single unit and the yellow is the only single unit districts that currently allow ADUs. So closer to something like eight to 12% uh, of those properties actually allow ADUs across the city. Here's where we've received permits uh, for ADU construction in the past 10 years, since 2010, 12 years. We've only seen about 400 ADUs permitted. And so not quite the, the boon we were expecting or knowing to that could be possible, but a lot of that has to do with, you know, the zoning where they're allowed. You'll see that they're concentrated in places like Platt Park, uh, Berkeley, Curtis Park and things like that. And so one of those first hurdles is allowing folks to actually be able to build an ADU, but the next hurdle is really helping folks get those built. And so we're looking at the ladder in this project. ADUs are heavily regulated. It's one of the most regulated building forms, just like any other thing. If you were to build a garage on your property, you have to follow similar rules as far as setbacks, height requirements, placement, square footage, things like that. But because ADUs have those sort of uh, lot size square footages tied to them and also those use restrictions, it becomes a bit more restrictive than other things. And so we're looking closely at those issues in this project. And finally, looking at this idea of context, uh, we really wanna ask the question, you know, what's appropriate throughout the city? We think we basically have the urban form ADU figured out in a lot of ways. That's where we're seeing them built uh, over the past decade, but places like suburban districts, which haven't historically allowed them, we really want to ask the question, you know, what should that ADU look like? Should it be one story or should it be uh, different square footage, different height requirements, greater setbacks? And so through our committee and process, we're looking really closely at developing those standards. Uh, just looking at this idea of context citywide, you know, the zoning code breaks down the city and in these different contexts. So looking just at those single unit properties, we have suburban, urban edge and urban context places. Uh, it's roughly broken down by thirds, you know, approximately 30,000 parcels of each context. And so pretty even split as far as character that we have across the city. But we're looking closely at those lot sizes. What does it mean, you know, when you're an urban lot, uh, you're probably around 6,000 square feet compared to a suburban lot where you're most likely around, you know, 10,000 square feet on average, much larger, uh, things like that. So as far as the process, you know, we just had our fourth committee meeting on Thursday, in fact, uh, we're currently evaluating some of the alternatives. Uh, so we're about halfway through the project, it's still early on, but we're just starting to really ask the tough questions about what should be going on, starting to propose some of these alternatives. We've got plenty of more public outreach to happen throughout the project. We've got a suburban context focus group that's meeting next week. Uh, a couple of more focus groups coming up with meeting with like the architects, AIA, really looking at the designer builder issues. Uh, and we'll have a public meeting coming up later in the end of July. We've just closed our public survey. And so we've got some pretty good data around that, but we're still looking at uh, what all was said, we had about 400 respondents in those surveys, and so quite a bit of information to go through.
but where we are in the process now is thinking about these alternatives. And so some of the big ticket items that we just, just discussed this week with the committee were things like uh, this idea of minimum lot size, height in stories, some of the building form regulations that we want to take a look at, which could really move the needle, we think, uh, more than anything. Things like the bulk plane height, we want to ask if those things are appropriate. Building coverage exemption, setbacks, and uh, reuse of existing structures, we've heard is very important and people are interested in. We're also looking at the idea of owner occupancy, uh, what happens when you move away from your property and you have an ADU. Currently, you're required to either sell your property or decommission the ADU. And so the idea of kind of removing uh, a usable housing, housing unit from the market doesn't really sit well with a lot of our citywide policies and direction. Uh, we're looking more closely at creating those suburban contact zone districts. So really figuring out the numbers there dimensionally. And then of course, as I mentioned, uh, allowing ADUs with other uses like duplexes, row homes, things like that. So yeah, just to quickly go through some of these alternatives. Uh, this idea of minimum lot size, you're not allowed to have an ADU if you don't meet the minimum lot size requirement that's in the code. Uh, we've heard that, you know, it's a bit inequitable and kind of arbitrary in a lot of ways. If you're three square feet short, you know, you can't quite get there. So if you have, let's say, a USUC lot size and your lot size is 5,400 square feet, not quite 5,500 square feet, you're technically not allowed to do a detached ADU. You can do an attached ADU, but we know that the detached product is a little bit more appealing to a lot of folks. And so we've discovered that citywide, we have about 21,500 lots that uh, are currently ineligible for detached ADU, even if their zoning allowed it. And so looking closely at if that makes sense, should we change those numbers? Should we just lower them, change the thresholds? Uh, but we think we could open up quite a bit of market here if, if we were to remove that entirely. Uh, this idea of the height in stories is a really complicated one. And so ADUs are limited to one and a half stories in height, which technically means that your upper story may only be 75% of your lower story. And so looking at, you know, sort of a typical lot size here, uh, the allowance on paper is 650 square feet. But once you start whittling into some of those restrictions, like the bulk plane, like the parking allowance, ground floor, uh, it's really hard to get to 650 square feet of usable uh, ADU. You know, it's really hard to get to a comfortable unit. This one, after cutting back, you know, taking away 25% of a footprint, you're actually only allowed about 400 square feet of livable space. And so this is something we're really asking the question of if, if that restriction is right or if that's getting in the way. Because on the outside, I mean, you're getting a building form that, you know, looks like two stories, smells like two stories, but really just overcomplicates construction design and a bit of feasibility. I mean, how many of us can live in a 400 square foot unit comfortably? today. So really thinking about that idea of housing options and, you know, what's livable. Uh, another one is this idea of the bulk plane. We've heard that uh, trying to squeeze two floors into the current bulk plane standards makes it pretty difficult. Uh, it really cuts into your head height in a lot of ways. And so builders wind up, you know, building something like this product that uh, fills up the entire bulk plane. But because it's kind of low on the ends. If you want to do parking below, if you want to provide uh, storage for vehicles, you have to e essentially have a eight, nine foot floor in order to get a garage door on the ground floor. And so your upper story really becomes compressed in a lot of ways. And so your habitable space, once again, gets cut into on those two sides of the unit. We're looking really closely at some of these design issues and want to know how livable are we allowing these units to be on paper, yes, but in reality, it might be a different story. Uh, the building coverage exemption is a big one that's, you're allowed to exempt 50% of your footprint of your unit from the building coverage rules, which, you know, those are put in place for a reason, those are good things. But currently it only applies to vehicular storage areas. So in order to get that exemption, you have to provide 80% of your ground floor as vehicular storage. And so this really makes it difficult for someone to build a single story ADU if they wanted to, if say they had room to just, you know, park their vehicle next to the unit and they're closer to, the, to their 37 and a half percent full lot coverage. 
we're essentially forcing them to build, you know, a larger, more expensive unit than they would possibly want to. Uh, we want to enable the more affordable thing. So we don't see enough single story ADUs and looking at changing this restriction or at least allowing accessory dwelling units to achieve the same exemption. Uh, we feel like would go a long way with increasing affordability and some of those housing options. And then finally, we're looking at the suburban context really closely, this idea of setbacks. We hear a lot about privacy, shadows, impacts to neighbors. Uh, and so here's an example. This is a suburban context neighborhood. So there's no alley here. We're currently in the backyard of someone's home uh, looking at two properties. And so this is what your neighbor could potentially build in the future on the left is a primary structure which the code allows today so anyone can tear down their existing you know suburban home and or add on to it they could add this uh essentially three stories two and a half story structure that would have to be set back 20 feet uh, but would be allowed to go up to 35 feet tall and so you could have windows you know clearly facing your backyard changing the potential privacy or feel of your backyard that's in the backyard compared to an accessory dwelling unit. And so we're asking the question, well, you know, what's appropriate for an ADU? Uh, what's appropriate here as an ADU standard? And so we're looking at what should the height be? What should the setback be? And you know, what feels appropriate here? Finally, this idea of reusing of existing structures. We have a lot of issues in the code that don't allow something like this, you know, cute little red garage to be built if it doesn't meet the current ADU set setbacks. And so, because this this garage is not set back five feet off the alley, uh, you're no longer allowed to use any portion of that structure as an ADU. And so, you know, potentially the gray new ADU here possibly had a, a garage that could have been converted in some ways if we were to get the zoning out of the way. So we want to ask the question if, you know, should we create allowances for that? Should we allow the new portions of the structure to, you know, come into compliance and actually allow you to use a bit of that existing structure, do the potentially sustainable thing and use the building that already exists versus having to demolish it, bring it to landfill and, and things like that. And so we know zoning gets in the way. Building code has a lot of do that. complications as well, but we think the zoning uh, is definitely creating barriers. Uh, so that's all I have for my portion. You guys can contact me at any time. Josh Palmieri, joshua.palmieri at denvergov.org. Abe is also working on the project with me. I'm sure lots of you are familiar with him and our project website can be found on the denvergov.org slash text amendment page. But I'm not sure if you wanna do questions now or do you wanna move over to Sean for a minute? Uh, let's do a few questions and then we'll move over to Sean. But um, uh, a couple of questions. Um, one of them is, um, it says, what, what would be street parking requirements for ADUs? Off street requirements, we have no requirements for single unit dwellings citywide. So currently we do not require any parking off site for a single unit. And that same requirement is extended to an accessory dwelling unit because the use is the same. It's a simply an accessory use to a single unit primary. Uh, there are no current requirements. We do have that parking is incentivized through that lot coverage exemption. And so the way that the city has always sort of gone about it is exempting a garage up to 500 square feet. And so we've seen that the, you know, the market is yielding off street parking. It's potentially harder to sell a product without any parking provided. And so uh, it hasn't been uh, an issue. Uh, next question is this, you mentioned there's about 400 ADUs that folks have applied for. How many of them are licensed for short-term rental versus, I think she means providing longer-term housing? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, this is a tough one because there's quite a bit of a distinction as far as short-term rentals. A lot of short-term rentals are occurring in units that are second units, but are not actually ADUs and are not fully permitted as ADUs. We know that there's about 120 short-term rentals that exist in second units. But we also know that based on our assessor's data, there's about 1,500 citywide second units and only about 400 of them have been permitted as ADUs. So it's not quite 
400 to one. It's more about more like 1500 to one. So it's a pretty low percentage. That's about 10% of second units are currently being short-term rented out. Okay, thank you. One other question. Um, issues regarding those places that have, you know, they're trying to do conservation overlays for ADUs, or we've been working in Baker for at least three years on doing ADUs because clearly we have a lot of info. We've had a lot of units since the early 1900s that are, you know, what would we now call ADUs? So, um, you know, how is that going to work together? So why don't, if you can go into that a bit. I mean, as far as bringing units into compliance or? No, the conservation overlay. Yeah, I mean, this, this, we're just going to modify the base zoning. So, I mean, whatever's, whatever's applicable currently in the conservation overlay, like something like Curtis Park, which allows, you know, full two stories, uh, exemptions from lot coverage and things like that would not, not would not be modified. The conservation overlays are in place, unless potentially you know what we increase is less restrictive than a conservation overlay. We might look at uh, potentially amending some of those. But I think you know through this project and through our committee, we're actually looking really closely at some of those conservation overlays because they've been you know so successful, uh, especially things like Curtis Park. And so yeah, we're looking at what works well there and what we can apply citywide. All right, why don't we go on to Sean and then we'll we'll have more questions afterward. Yeah, sounds great. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Sean Johnson. Um, I am on the advisory board with uh, or committee with Joshua. Um, I came to be on that because uh, uh, for a couple of years now, my family has been in the process of building an ADU on our property. Uh, we submitted our plans uh, and had our hearings in uh, the early beginning of uh, 2021, we were building an ADU to house my mom who was disabled uh, and had gotten really sick in, 20, in 2019 and into 2020. Uh, we were in compliance with most of, with all of the uh, headache of building uh, and designing an ADU, fitting it into the bulk plane, like Josh said, trying to create a comfortable living space in that 75% that you get, which is about 400 something square feet. But in the circumstances for our family, we needed to ask for an additional 95 square feet so that we could enclose the stairway um, so that mom, so we could install a chairlift to get, to allow my mom to safely enter uh, the project. Um, I wanted to, Oh, shift as well. oh. To share an example, this is uh, the top inset picture is what currently exists on our property, which is just a garage. Uh, it's more of a shed. <laughs> it's not very really functional, uh, but we were going to replace it with this uh, design. We did all the things that we were instructed to do. We went to our RNO, we presented our plan. Uh, even when we made a slight change of the design, I went back to the RNO and presented. Uh, we got approval um, from the unanimous vote uh, from our neighbors as well. We took in uh, to the BOA uh, the, my mom's letter from my mom's personal doctor, a uh, letter from the Social Security Administration. Uh, we took letters from our direct neighbors who approved of our project. I contacted and we could not be approved through this BOA uh, because there was just inexplicable bias against our family that was consistent. Um, and we saw the bias because other families who came in and who were not qualified to act because they have rules of what you can for variances weren't allowed and they were approved and we weren't. Uh, so that prompted me because we needed the housing for my family. We couldn't just leave. Uh, that prompted me to sort of keep speaking up. I went to city council. I called the mayor's office. I called the office or director of disability rights. Anybody who would listen, I contacted, including Lamone, who uh, supplied me with the letter for a follow-up hearing. Um, she was listed as one of the organizations that we could contact, who I, I suppose had a say in projects going on in neighborhoods. And she and three of the other people who were organizations who were listed provided that letter. We still got nowhere with the BOA. So after being disproved or not approved and not approved and not approved at the three hearings that we attended, um, I didn't know what else to do, so I just went to the city asking for help. And in seeking that help, uh, the zoning administrator at the CPD uh, allowed us to go through what was an administrative adjustment 
uh, first impression, we were the first people to do this with a disability request. And that allowed us to get the administrative adjustment to resubmit for the permit. We're still waiting on the approval of the permit uh, all these years later, um, but that is how I got in contact with the, with the ADU advisory board. And I'm really impressed so far with the work that's being done. A lot of the issues that we faced in uh, just designing the project, where you have to keep it in bulk plane or the setbacks and everything else, especially on our smaller lot, uh, really complicated just, I mean, the time that it took to even submit the first time. Um, so I think it's going really well. And I hope that more people will show up and give feedback to how to create these solutions. I'm not sure, Lamon, if you wanted me to touch on anything else in particular, but let me know and I can, I'll, I'll fill in. <laughs> well, your personal story is good because now we're talking about the application of the um, ADU zoning and the opportunities for residents to um, uh, build up their um, property at an ADU, for seniors to stay instead of having to sell out and go away. Um, and, and from what I'm seeing this morning, it still looks like it's a complicated process. So I'm hoping that the committee can whittle that down to where real life people like us, because I'm a 30 year resident of Park Hill, can do what ADU was really set out and intended to do. It should not be for high end investors, for uh, high income homeowners, it should be uh, set up to where existing homeowners can build out their properties, generate rental income and stay put. Exactly. That's what our family, that's what our family is trying to do. Yeah, I yeah. hear you, man. I'm with you. Let me know how I can help. Thank you. You did help. You did help. You have helped. I'll help some more too. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> I received one question. Um, Hold on, let me get it. I think it came only to me directly from Miles. Um, when the city removes single family zoning, how will this impact ADU requirements? Each lot will be allowed to have duplex, triplex, and quadplex per this zoning change. I think it depends on the size of the lot. Um, will size restrictions be eliminated? Ooh, I don't know, a lot of hypotheticals in there. Uh, that's a tough one. I think, you know, the future scenarios, we're gonna look closely at what that means. I don't think we're gonna do anything inappropriate beyond what's allowed today. And so we do have standards as far as lot coverage, you know, density requirements and things like that. Uh, we are looking at this project as far as allowing ADUs to be accessory to more things. And so if the city does move to multiple units, two units everywhere, who knows? I mean, this is all speculation. Uh, ADUs, you know, would technically be allowed in that regard. And so we need to look closely at what the allowance would be. We're not sure, we're not, we're not there yet, but it's definitely something we're keeping an eye on. Um, this is kind of a follow up too. I mean, Curtis Park, as in Baker, our lot sizes are 25 feet uh, wide, very narrow, not like suburban Southeast Denver or or someplace Southwest Denver, some other neighborhoods. Um, Joel writes, I would suggest exploring if some of the Curtis Park special ADU allowances would also work well um, whenever narrow lots are typical. It's the narrow lots that are um, incompatible with existing regulations and with how the small lot interacts with bulk plant, which is so true. Let's learn from that mm -hmm. and find the particular context where similar flexibility would make sense. The other issue that I, I want to bring up when we're talking about like Curtis Park and Baker, we're talking about um, landmark historic neighborhoods right so keeping the character so kind of those two questions the 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 modifications in the bulk plane and also those changes in um you know those landmark and keeping that kind of issues in in um in in the forethought too yeah certainly i mean joel i think you'll appreciate the conversation at the last committee meeting we 
looked really closely at that. Yeah, narrow lot issues. There was a lot of folks on the committee that were interested in based on context. Yeah, changing the ball pl bulk plane, especially for those narrow lots, maybe removing it entirely for our narrowest lots or even, you know, increasing setbacks where need to be decreasing set setbacks in other places. And so that's definitely top of mind. Uh, as far as, you know, landmark districts, we do have some interest on the committee as well as simply just allowing ADUs by right uh, in landmark districts and help to, in a sense, and helps to, you know, prevent demolition or prevent modification of the existing structure. But we know based on other cities that when ADUs are allowed, people are more likely to uh, keep the existing structure intact and in place. And so it definitely helps with uh, character. And because they're smaller units towards the rear of the lot, they typically, you know, don't impact the street, uh, the, the appearance of the neighborhood from the street. And so we think there's a lot of benefits there as well. There's another question about um, will Nest communities and are they participating right now and given a chance to participate? Which community, communities are these? Sorry. Nest, I forget what the acronym stands for. <laughs> Somebody else fill me in. Underprivileged neighborhoods. Yeah. But but yeah, certainly. I mean, it's a it's a citywide initiative, and so we're working closely with uh, folks like Renee Martinez Stone. She's on our committee as well, looking at like GES coalition. Uh, lots of these neighborhoods that have been historically sort of marginalized in a lot of ways. We know that many of our uh, non permitted ADUs exist in these communities, and so we want to make sure we do everything that we can to get the regulations out of the way and make sure that they are building something that is safe and up to code. But yeah, we've got great representation uh, from those communities. Um, it, there was a comment from Bill Tanner saying, love ADUs, first place I owned and lived in Denver, had a small ADU in back, helped me afford housing payments and gave a low income tenant a place to live, still there. Nice. Um, Lamone, can you go ahead and just um, repeat what you put in the the uh, um, the chat? Okay. Um, so, Josh, I was looking at the map that you had presented earlier with the red dots on it, um, and I'm noticing a high concentration of ADUs uh, in West Denver and Southwest Denver. Very little activity east of um, Broadway in the Nest communities, which uh, Emmett referred to earlier, and also, you know, into um, Park Hill. I know that that parts of Park Hill is resistant to um, ADUs, mm -hmm. whereas in North and Northeast Park Hill, there's a lot of seniors who could benefit from this um, plan. So is it a matter of outreach or what? why is the representation of ADUs in on the east side so low that's a good question i think it starts with you know where they were where the zoning was allowed currently uh adus are not allowed in places like montbello lots of lots of east denver lots of northeast park hill they're not currently zoned for them and so there's an inherent barrier there just to start you know it's a six to nine month process to rezone your property a thousand dollar fee uh, but we are encouraging folks to go through the legislative process with their council members. And so if there is interest there in a larger, you know, community wide, neighborhood wide, you know, even block by block wide interest uh, to reach out to their council members and encourage that. I, and I want to add that West Denver, like Baker, we had infill, like I said, since the early 1900s. So we've had what you now call an ADU since I had in my house, we had a picture on our lot that had a two-story um, a duplex, a, a, a brick duplex in our backyard. I'd like to put that back in, but I, <laughs> it was taken out in the 1930s probably. But I mean, we have a lot and we've had a lot since the early 1900s. Uh, Emmett, go ahead. Yes, I have a question because I've uh, inquired about this ADU program, especially out in Southwest Denver for over a year now, a year and a half, and I've gotten no feedback. Um, from the participants in, in the project. And um, <clears throat> I know that a lot of the residents out there are getting 
money from the city to build these ADUs and we're not being given that opportunity. How did this all happen? Yeah, there is a pilot program that's out right now through host or housing office of stability and they're piloting it through the WDRC. So West Denver Renaissance Collaborative. Uh, they're the ones that are currently receiving majority of that funding uh, because they're partnering with Habitat and because they're, you know, doing this low income loan scenario with property owners. And so the pilot was established there, but they are looking at expanding that citywide uh, in the coming years. And so it is still new and fresh, but I think they're seeing great success with that program. And, and we look forward to you know, more opportunity, especially on the east side, like you mentioned. Are the taxpayers putting that bill? And if that is, is if that's the case, why isn't this an equitable project? Yeah. It's a good question. I'm not sure exactly where the funding comes from. I and mean, it comes from the host, you know, their their funding stream. Uh, and so it's a portion of affordable housing. But I think the fact that it is simply just a pilot for now, it's like a one year temporary pilot, it's a pretty small pot of money to start, but uh, it will be, you know, expanded and treated more equally, equitably in the future. Okay, um, we have a couple of questions from Miles and then we'll go to Drew. Um, Miles, you might have to ask yours and looking at neighbor privacy for ADUs, what are your specific criteria? What will not be allowed? You might need to ask that specifically. And do you have the cost per square foot for detached ADUs? I don't know that you would as, um, and what cost would be considered affordable? I'm assuming that's up to developers. <laughs> yeah, but, no, um, no, I, I, the, the, I think the question is, is so in looking at, it looks like you're gonna change the building envelope for the ADUs and look at making it larger. So in looking at the impacts of those changes and the distance to the neighbors, what is the city's criteria for what's allowed? I mean, you talk about privacy, but what are the concrete um, requirements or are there and it's or is it just up to uh, the city to decide that for themselves it would be nice to have some knowledge as to how the city reviews that and then the cost per square foot I know ADUs basically are you're building a whole separate house mm -hmm. so the cost for that and what is a affordable building cost so where does it sit in that scenario thank you yeah, it's good questions. I mean, these are all things that we're working through uh, with our committee. So, you know, we're not making these decisions as the city on our own. We're definitely trying to balance, uh, as you saw in that image, you know, what could be built today. So what could be built as a primary in a lot of ways is a lot more intrusive than uh, what an ADU could be built as. And so we're trying to balance the question between privacy and between uh, housing. You know, I mean, we really need to prioritize housing and housing options. And Looking at things like privacy screening, you know, we can always uh, require things like trees or landscaping or things like that in between. But, but yeah, we're definitely trying to find a balance uh, between what exists today, primary structures with three-story allowance uh, and looking at what setback feels appropriate. As far as cost, yeah, I mean, the average ADU price is coming in around about $300,000. Uh, but, you know, average home sale price is what, $600,000 in Denver now. So, I mean, I think affordability is being defined day by day, but we're looking really closely at what can we do uh, to even lower those numbers further. And so we're talking really closely with builders and developers and trying to figure out ways to actually increase that square footage because, I mean, the, the price per square foot is pretty horrendous as far as ADUs go. If, you know, in that example that I've shown, you can only build 400 square feet uh, of livable space, but cost you 300 grand, it's not a great return. And so we're looking really close at what can we do to, to help out? Okay, just a quick follow up. It would be, I think it would be helpful if when you guys are talking about the privacy of the adjacent neighbors, if you had clear, um, descriptive specifics for different size lots, because the, the building envelope, the full size of the garage is quite different than a setback. Um, so anyways, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Good things to consider. Drew, go ahead. Um, just, I'll try to be quick. Um, more of a comment. Um, this is a great discussion, but kind of following up on Emmett and Miles' concerns. 
Um, one of the things is, is uh, I've been, I'm an architect. And I actually have something that I'd love to convert to an ADU, but it's probably a 90 year old building built out of wood. People refer to it as a barn. It would make a cute ADU, but I think the costs would just be, it would be, I mean, I'm an architect, I know these things, it'd be easier to scrape it. I mean, you know, and, and I hate to do that. It's just, so the costs are, and the, the other thing too is uh, you, you show units where you put parking below. To me, that just seems like a waste to, to build all of this so you can park your damn car when we're trying to get rid of cars. Um, you know, so you can live above it in a little tiny uh, attic. Um, so there, there's just a lot of things that go on here. And I have about 400 square feet footprint that could be uh, of the bottom level. So, but you still have to have in a house, you've got to have a foundation, walls, roofs, you've got to have bathrooms, plumbing, electrical, all of that. But then if you make it a little bit larger, that additional, you know, it could just be floor, wall, you're, you're not, your systems, um, it becomes less expensive per square foot. So I, I think these are all really good discussions, but I think it's still not really affordable because of construction costs. It's just, it's just not. So I, I think there ought to be some ways to help people that need it you know, not help the people, you know, that don't need it to, to build these kind of structures, you know, programs, Habitat is doing some great things, but they're kind of limited, but maybe as a city, we can find a way to help neighborhoods because it has so many advantages, like Lamone has said, it helps people stay in the neighborhood. They're not pushed out and gentrified. Anyway, just more of a comment, sorry. Yeah, thanks for that. Lamone, go ahead. Um, so Sean, now I'm I'm surprised that your ADU is still in flux, and I'm sorry to hear that. But based upon your experience as a homeowner trying to get your project done, and then your experience on the ADU subcommittee, um, is there anything you would have done differently? Um, I wish that there was something that I could have done differently. I. I know that I'm speaking about myself, but I know that our family planned and we did everything right. We didn't, we don't not have our permit or our ADU, I think because we made missteps. We submitted our plans according to the rules of the city and we just weren't giving equitable access. Uh, the things that I wish I could have done was to wait. I wish that I could have been submitting to uh, the BOA that's been reestablished that I would have been able to go and present to a, a qualified board of a, a adjustments. I wish that I would I could be in that position. I wish that I could be building maybe in the circumstances that new residents will have after the work of the committee is done because they're addressing a lot of uh, things that complicated the process for us and having to compromise on the size of the home. It's still only a studio apartment. And I think that the circumstances for building in the future are gonna make it, it's, it's gonna be, a, it, it'll end up being a better investment for what you can get for your buck under these new rules. Um, like our lot will be different. There will be different setbacks uh, and changes hopefully that come down the, the pipe. So I think uh, if I could change anything, it would just be that all the work that's being done now could have been done uh, two years ago. But I'm glad of the things that came out of our experience. I felt like I thought that it was, there were systemic issues with the BOA and how they were um, granting permits. And so having those things ad addressed is good. Um, going through with the administrative adjustment process with the zoning administrator and them establishing that pathway, especially for residents who are seeking accommodations for disabilities, that's a good thing. And it, it would have been nice to go through the process with those things in place now, but we couldn't. Uh, my mom was really sick and we, we thought that we were losing her. So we had to move forward in that time frame, And we've had to keep trying to move forward in this time frame, even though we were talking about affordability, the cost of the project has now gone up substantially. We were, we were planning to build in uh, like 20, 
21 to, you know, and those were completely different circumstances than we're having to build now. And we're still waiting for our permit to be issued. And it keeps going month after month with new inflation rates and it, it's just messed up. But I, I hope that uh, the things that have changed now and the things that are being established are gonna make it easier for other families because the housing is imperative and it's a, it's a really good tool for the city to have in its box. So I don't know what I could change. <laughs> Well, uh, Sean, I appreciate you um, joining the call and sharing your story. And, and Josh, I'm glad you were able to come on and share the plan um, and, and, and allow the members on the call uh, an opportunity to see it and then provide opportunities for us to get involved. So thank you very much. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And I think, you know, that issue of housing stock, I think you both have brought that up, Sean and, and Joshua. I think, you know, it, it, I mean, it's not just, and we do talk about, you know, people being able to stay in place, but also having family members, you know, be there. I always think, who am I going to have? And I'll move into my ADU if I ever have the money to build one too. <laughs> and so I know that. And, and the cost is prohibitively expensive. I have a small project. I know the difference between 2019 and 2022. It's crazy. So, but I, we really appreciate that. And, and we have the city passing, you know, the, uh, um, the new, um, what do they call it? The new, um, uh, housing housing you know equitable you know not equitable but um affordable housing you know and they're trying to always find affordable affordable housing but i think as they um one person noted in the chat being able to have somebody live in a place that's less expensive you know might be a smaller place but they have their own place and they're able to afford that that's a great thing so we do appreciate this and i think it's an ongoing conversation i think we would want to have you come back sean especially to hear if you get approved <laughs> you know we're, we're we're we're, yeah we're we're hoping you do and 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 joshua you know changes so we would love to find out more and um is there a way that people could contact you joshua um you know and if you want to put link in the chat to email or or to yeah. anything on the website please go ahead and do that um i don't know if there's any more questions thank everyone for their comments i appreciate that thank you yeah. Yeah, my info is all on the project webpage. I'll post that okay. in the chat as well. But you can just go to adusindenver.com. That's the easiest way to get right there. When do you think that next public meeting will be? We're looking at uh, end of July, early August. And so, okay. yeah, working through some concepts with the committee before we start to bring some of our preferred all right. alternatives public. If you send that to Lamone, myself, then we'll be able to post that on the website and have people look for that so you can attend. And I think that would provide an opportunity for more questions and answers at that time. Um, so um, we appreciate that. I don't know if we have anybody else who's, anybody from INC on that, on that committee right now? I don't know that anybody is. Yes, I'm on the committee. You are. Okay. Okay. Great. Perfect. All right. So we appreciate this conversation, um, it, you know, and it's interesting. Is that map also on the website of ADUs, that map? Yeah, it should be. I mean, all of our pre previous presentations are on there. So. Okay, great. Perfect. We'll link to that. Um, thanks for your presentation. Thanks for presenting today. We appreciate you being here on a Saturday and taking time out for us today. Um, we are at the close of our meeting now, and I'm just wondering if anybody has any new business they want to bring up or anything else before we adjourn for today. I am not seeing anything. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask for a motion to adjourn and we will go ahead and close out the meeting today. Okay. I, I, I move that we adjourn. Great. I'll second it.
Here's a second that. motion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Emma will. All yeah. right, I'm going to go ahead and close the meeting. So thank you all for participating, and we look forward to seeing you next month for the Heat Islands. All right, mm -hmm. take care. Bye, everyone. Have a good Saturday. Stay cool.